Uh, this one is a bit of a mystery still when my first tweet is going to happen. Ken is fun and Ken is a great um, friend to Barbie. I call it catching the F friend. I was this just this fat unit, you know what I mean, in a in a in a suit, and it was clear that I was not I was not the same as the others. Happy New Year, everybody, and welcome back to WFA's Better Marketing Podcast. And indeed, what a way we're going to start 2022 with one of the absolute legends of the English advertising industry, Sir John Hegarty. Um, I'm about to meet him and I will undoubtedly talk about the agency he's worked at, so let me not say that. But what I would say is I think Sir John has been an inspiration to many in this industry. And in fact, the first agency I went to see when I became a client at the Coca-Cola company and I'd left running Low Howard Speak was indeed BBH, just so I could see how they worked on the inside. So, but John, how marvellous that you've joined us. Thank you so much. Can't think of a better way to start the WFA Better Marketing New Year, because rather bizarrely, uh, given my passion for it, uh, we haven't once asked anybody to come and talk about what I consider to be the most important thing in marketing, which is creativity. So welcome. <laughs> I'm, I'm proud to be the first person to talk about that. Yes, wonderful. Wonderful to be here. Yeah, and you and I, when we were discussing this before, um, just to get two or three interesting things out of the way, one thing that people won't know about you, which I absolutely love, is that um, one of your passions is making marmalade. And, and it is. the finest oranges for marmalade, uh, civil oranges these days come from New Zealand. <laughs> Do you want to tell us a bit well, about that I, first? I, well, first of all, I, I, I absolutely adore uh, marmalade, and I decided many years ago, why am I buying it when I should be making it? And so uh, I've gone through various stages of, of developing my skills at marmalade making. The problem you have, it only happens once a year. You can't yeah. sort of go, ah, oh, well, never mind, I'll go and make it next week. Because... So now what I do is I buy three kilos of marmalade of, of oranges i freeze two of them and i make one batch see how that goes and then in two months time i'll make make another batch and then another batch but i love them you can't and they i keep saying wait, 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 they've got to be seville please okay. any recipe that goes if you can't get seville oranges then don't make marmalade <laughs> make something yeah. else no but i love it it's great well, there you go. I thought, we, I thought we'd do that because what that means is having looked at many a uh, podcast and speech you've given, this is the one thing you've never talked about. <laughs> <laughs> I have never, ever, I've never actually ever, ever talked about that. I mean, the only other thing I've never talked about is that I, I was once in a group with Nick Mason of the Pink Floyd. Uh, that's uh, another thing that I've not really talked oh, wow. about. That, that's, that's another story. <laughs> That is another story. Well, we'll save that for the next one because what you've done. We we'll save that, that for the next one. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful thing that you do in ads, which is teasers. But you know, when you and I were talking, it's remarkable to think. I think you actually started in the business back in 1967. So a jubilee. 65, of some sort of David. Even 65, even. Oh my God. <laughs> earlier, even earlier. Yeah. You know, I, I do say to people, it was around about the time because obviously you say 1965, people look at you and think oh my god there were the dark ages what was going on then you know they were still reading newspapers on kind of stones and things like that but it was just when the beatles released help so i kind of feel that kind of gives it a bit more kind of uh, uh presence yes yeah, 1965 I mean, I think, yeah and obviously I love it when things say you need no introduction, which is always followed by an introduction. But I mean, just, just to kind of remind everybody, you know, you were one of the founding fathers of Saatchi and Saatchi. Um, you left Indeed. that and uh, worked closely with Charles to then start up TBWA in the UK. And of course, strangely and rather magnificently, in the very week that I got a job in advertising, the cover of campaign was the start of Bogle Bartle Hegarty. And indeed, yes, I had a great indeed. Job when I was at Barclays of celebrating the 30th anniversary of, you know, what's been, I think we can safely say the finest creative agency in the world for a very long while. Yes, so, that's a wonderful introduction. I'll, I'll take that. I'll well, keep it that. Yeah. 
And, and what about, I mean, as you reflect back, uh, and I know you're still very active doing all sorts of things, um, have you seen a shift in the importance of creativity? And, I, and by this, I think it's worth asking you to pull out. There's advertising on the one hand, but then there's the yeah. briefing, the thinking, the planning, the insights that get you there. I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on all of that. Well, I think the, the, the big shift, I think, that's happened um, in the industry over the last 20 years, 25 years, is the development, obviously, of digital technology. And I, I kind of explain that when a profound, significant piece of technology occurs, creativity kind of steps back because everybody becomes obsessed with the technology. And then when eventually we kind of go, right, I understand how it works, I understand who's watching it, looking at it, using it, then creativity comes to the fore and says, right, this is how to use this piece of technology. And I, I as examples of that, I, 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 I used, you know, when Gutenberg invented movable type in 1440 or whenever it was, I mean, it was a revolution. I mean, people don't understand the ability to print books at quantity was phenomenal. And, you know, it presaged the Renaissance and it did all kinds of things. So he was the sort of Steve Jobs, Zuckerberg of his age. But my point is, what did he print? He printed the Bible. He didn't go to a writer and say, I've got this idea for books, write me an amazing book. He took a book that had been around for years and reprinted it. And that sense of kind of um, using something that's already there constantly happens. So technology comes to the fore, creativity goes backwards. By the way, he didn't, he didn't do another book. Uh, and I did. I do a talk on this called "Can You Name Gutenberg's Second Book?" Um, and it's how technology takes over for a period of time, and then creativity comes in. So you know, the Lumiere brothers invent the moving camera. Um, they gave up on it. They actually couldn't work out what to do with it and left it alone. They didn't realise they'd invented Hollywood. And you know, um, Les Paul invents the electric guitar. He's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, not because of anything he wrote but because he developed the electric guitar. But it took about 15, 20 years, no, maybe 15 years before somebody wrote Rock Around the Clock and Elvis Presley appeared on the, on the scene and you suddenly thought, ah, that's what you do with an electric guitar. And it all changed. So I think, sorry, long answer to a very Great uh, simple, short question. I think we're in that world now. I think, I am, I'm an optimist, I'm cursed as an optimist. I kind of beginning to understand it a bit more. We're seeing the failings of it. We're seeing the kind of advantages of it, understanding how to use it. Um, and in that sense, creativity will come back into the fore again, because once you're, you're kind of familiar with the technology, you go, right, now what can you do with it? You know, as I yeah. say, I don't walk into an amazing cinema and sit there and go, isn't it incredible they're projecting a, a picture onto an amazing screen, you know, 100 feet wide and the sound is Dolby. I go in and I go, well, that wasn't a very good film and leave. And I think yeah. we're going to get to that point. That's magnificent. And what about, let's talk a little bit about clients. I know, uh, hopefully we'll have a lot of people watching this, but many of, many of them will be clients. I mean, have you seen a shift in working with clients? I mean, as you scan back, and if so, yes, yeah, sadly, I, I, yeah, I sadly I have. I think when advertising was at its best, and I think good times will come back. I'm not one of those that says we've we've seen it all. I think there was a wonderful sort of relationship between the client and the advertising agency. I think there was a sort of um, a clash, a constructive clash of needs, of desires. So agencies, when they were at their best, were very good at challenging clients. Good clients were really excellent at challenging agencies, but you both valued what it was that you were trying to create. You both valued this thing, this piece of work, this piece of magic that you create. You know, I, I, in my book, I, I described it as turning intelligence into magic. And that, that piece of magic was going to, transform the sales 
the opportunities of the company, its perception in the marketplace. And it required a kind of a dramatic relationship of respect, but challenging each other. What I see today is I see clients talking to them who become over-reliant upon the technology, upon data. Uh, data has always been important, but over-reliance upon it, that it will somehow give them the answer. Um, and that's a kind of lazy way of thinking. It's like I can add it all up and come to the right answer by looking at lots of figures. It will never be that. It will always be, you know, salesmanship is, 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 is not a science, it's an art. That was a great line of William Birnbach's in 1953. And, and it will always be, whatever you want to do, what everybody's going to tell you out there, everybody coming into your office and saying, I can predict the future, or I can predict that, it, it won't. They are snake oil salesmen. And they've always occurred, they've always been there, and they always will be there. You've got to see through them. The world, the yeah. history of the world is full of those people. It, in the end, will come down to a creative judgment because we are creative beings. We're not algorithms and we respond to that. That's why we're interesting. That's what makes us fascinating and that you have to understand that and then understand how you talk to those people and inspire them. Great brands inspire people to come to them. And I think we've lost that. And what, why, why do you think that is? I mean, beyond technology is a lack of training, a lack of understanding of the power of creativity. Where's the problem? I think a whole, yeah, I think a whole range of things. I think we've got a lot of um, obviously very bright marketing people who've come into the business in the digital world. They haven't really experienced the analog world. They've come into it in the digital world and they constantly look for answers in the digital world because that's what you're used to. And the great thing that creativity teaches you is it says you cannot go on doing the same thing accepting, expecting the same results. You cannot go on doing that. You've got to look outside where you are. You've got to dare to be different. And I think that's the great thing that, that creativity teaches you. And I think that's what I would be saying to marketing directors today. Yes, you know, technology is fantastic. You know, it's just incredible. But if it's not giving you all of the answers, you've got to look outside. And maybe you've got to go backwards to go forwards. And I, I, I sort of look at, you know, I, I try to step outside of advertising. I don't, I don't live, you know, I used to say to everybody, you know, I work in advertising, I don't live in advertising. And you've got to do that as a marketing person. You've got to step outside the world you're in, you know, toothpaste or whatever it might be, and realize there's a big wide world out there and people aren't obsessed with your product. So how do I get them to kind of give me a little bit more of their time? And so I look at things like, you know, I look at the Bond franchise and I go, why is the Bond franchise so successful? What have they done? Why is that? Because you can look at it as a brand. It's a brand, you know, yeah. it's, it's value in 1962 when it launched on in the cinema was maybe, I don't know, would you say 20 million? That's probably, maybe, maybe not. Its value today is vast. I mean, you know, it's like over a billion, over a billion. So how have they done that? What have they done? And kept the same end line, license to kill, kept the same piece of music. Dun, 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 dun. You know, I'm not a great singer. I won't go on for that, but you know what I mean. <laughs> and uh, 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 but what they do is they constantly refresh the story because they've developed a relationship with their audience. And I think brands today have forgotten how to develop a relationship with their audience. And you can't do it instantly, it has to be grown and you can't keep changing. So I look at, the, I look at things like that and go, why, well, why is that being successful? What, a, what could brands, commercial brands, learn from that world? Because if I'm the audience, and I hate using the word consumer, I think it's a horrible word. If I'm the audience, I don't break it all up. You know, I don't say, oh, that's advertising over here, that's films there. I go, what's interesting? What do I want to talk about? What fascinates me? Who's stimulated me? Who's inspired me? And that's the way you've got to think. And that way, if you do that, you might go, I could learn some lessons from these people. Stop changing all the time. Stop constantly changing my end line, my this, that. 
and get, have a constant conversation with my audience, but constantly refresh it and develop and develop a point of view like that. Fantastic. I mean, I do think Bond is interesting on many levels, isn't it? Because as we touched on when we were chatting before, you know, the ability to see into the future that they've had. So you watch a film that was on ice for two years, which must have been two years in the making, which is extremely mm. relevant to the pandemic situation yeah. we find ourselves in on the one hand. You also watch a film where I think, you know, The Guardian is always, every time a Bond films come out, They've always run an article that said, enough already. When will this sexist nonsense be over? But actually, you know, Bond is flexed, changed with the times and the trends were right. So they did, I, I think it's a great example because many of the things that great marketeers are good at, which is using their empathy, using their common sense and using the data, but proportionately is the way to go. And then, you know, on, on the mechanics of a brand, you know, we, can we talk about a couple of the very famous case studies you've got? I mean, obviously, the one of the longest living end lines is a bit more than that. It's a kind of company philosophy and it's the Audi one. Can you can you go back a little bit and tell us the story of Audi for those that don't know what you did? In yeah, the UK? it was 1982. We pitched for Audi. And um, at that time, um, it was a very, very dull brand. Even they admitted they were a very dull brand. It was bought by a and I, I'm not having a go at accountants here. This is a phrase from the research. It was bought by accountants and pensioners. Uh, it was a very reliable car, very well made. Thing is, people didn't realize it was German. And um, they thought it was Audi. It doesn't sound like a German name. They thought it was probably made in Belgium or somewhere like that. And its competitors obviously were BMW and Mercedes and Volkswagen, all very, very Germanic. Um, and we thought, first of all, we have to establish, we've got to establish the credentials of this car. We've got to understand that it's about engineering because they were brilliant engineers. Four wheel drive, performance four wheel drive that they developed was a phenomenal piece of uh, engineering. So we said we'd focus around that, but we'd make them remind people they're German and remind them that actually Germans can have a sense of humor. And that would be our place for it. And so we, we created the, the, the first ads and I, I'd gone to the factory in, in Ingolstadt and um, I was wandering around and they were, and I, I, I'm sure it was an old poster I saw on the wall and it was some, you know, and I said to the guy, what was that? And he said, oh, well, that was one of our old ads. And, and I said, what's that line, Vorsprung durch Technik underneath it? And he said, oh, that was an old line we used to use. Don't use that anymore. No, okay. And it went in, you know, it just went in like this. Anyway, so come back to London. We start working on the campaign. We start writing all these wonderful ads. And somebody quite rightly, I think it was Nigel, Nigel Bogle, my partner, said to me, but John, how do we tie it all together? What, you know, and, and of course I'm doing that. Oh, the, the brilliance of my creativity will tie it all together. Yes, John, thank you very much. No, it won't. You know, how do we tie this all together? And I walked away and I, I kind of went, I wonder if we could use that line, Wurschbrung durch Technik. And I, I was working with a wonderful writer, Barbara Noakes. And, and I said this to her and, and she said, hmm, as they say in Germany. And we said, that's what we should do. So at the end of every ad, we'll just have two cars drive on and Wurschbrung durch Technik, as they say in Germany. And we got Jeffrey Palmer, who is a wonderful actor very laconic very british very i almost say english in his delivery and he was doing it in a very sort of as i say laconic way and it just made it humorous uh but the great thing there it became famous they researched should we do this and research said whatever you do don't do it uh the british don't like the germans don't remind them it's german um it'll affect sales and it won't succeed Fortunately, we had a wonderful, wonderful uh, marketing director there, Brian Bowler, and Johnny Mazaris, who is um, head of advertising, both said, but we are German. Tell the truth. Why do we want to hide that? Um, and they said, we'll ignore the research and we're going to go with it. And the rest, as they say, is history. So, you know, it's a wonderful example. I think because we had executed it in a humorous way, people went with it and people forget that you can't judge that in research the humor of something uh, but Brian and Johnny both kind of said we can do this 
uh, and uh, they did it and that's how it, that's how it came about fantastic well, it's a great story and again i think you know that comment about what well, it's true is magnificent as well and it stood the test of yeah. time so you know when, when i see it today it still resonates it still works um and all power yeah. to the marketing people who've resisted the temptation to change because I also well, I think actually, point. David, not to spoil your story, I think they have now just changed it, <laughs> which oh, no. is, I think, hilarious. Yes, they have. Yeah, yeah. And they've done something um, about um, the future, something. And they, as soon as you were the, use the word future, in my view, you're not in the future. But anyway, but that's a funny, it's funny that you, we should do, literally, I think it's just changed. But oh, it, no, it stayed there for 30 years. Yeah, well, so it's an extremely good innings, but it's odd, isn't it? It's a bit like, you know, we we shared, and I think it was work that one of the finest bits of work BBH did in my Vodafone days was actually for the internal culture, which was red, rock, solid, and restless. Um, absolutely magnificent. Yes. Resonated all around the world. Our own people did all sorts of incredible things with it. We didn't need to tell them. Change of CEO, it got changed. And you kind of go, why? Yeah. Why have we changed it? And it didn't sound like an end line. You know, I, I loathe end lines. I loathe all that. But it sounded yeah. like something somebody would say. A person might say that. Oh, that's pretty good. You know, what, were the, what was the, the hippies were tune in, turn on, drop out? Well, great. You know, <laughs> a person says that, not a corporation. Don't be a corporation. Yeah. yeah. And I know the, um, you know, you talked at the WFA conference, sounds like I was sadly I wasn't there back in 2014, a fantastic one in Australia. And, and a couple of the things I noticed in there that I'd, I'd love you to kind of pull out is you were talking about the best brief, the best brief you could be given is if somebody turned up and said, look, what I'd like you to do is change the way this whole industry, this whole category is perceived. I mean, yeah. Again, can we talk a little bit about that and indeed, post that yeah. conversation did anybody turn up with that brief <laughs> no <laughs> i've always said actually that, that people people forget the importance of a brief and a brief is setting out your ambition what's the ambition and again i don't i don't look to advertising but i i i think it was when michelangelo was asked to paint the sistine chapel the brief from the Pope was make them believe um, and paint something that's going to make them believe and which is what he did and, and of course his other piece of genius is he put God on the ceiling so you when you yeah. looked up you saw God so what a wonderful piece of media buying uh, on the part of Michelangelo <laughs> but I think that's yeah. what you want to do and I people often say to me and I, I, I describe it like this they often say oh John what brand would you like to what product would you like to have worked on and i said i don't have any particular brand or product i like to work on but i want to work on something that has ambition to it so if somebody walked into me when i was in the agency and said by the way we we are called gkn we're a manufacturing engineering manufacturing company we want to do a campaign to make people understand that nuts and bolts are really interesting because you know john nuts and bolts hold the world together without them it all falls apart and i go wow that's a brief i want to work on that would be a real challenge and that's so that's what i love so when you're writing a brief when you're briefing whoever it is think about what's the ambition what am i trying to do with this and how broad is my ambition how big is it how do i want to command respect how do i want to command the audience all those things become fundamentally important as opposed to we're talking to abc ones 23 to 28 and it just become boring you know it just so you started off in a boring way not an exciting way yeah and it usually features things like we want to appeal to the youth without alienating their parents <laughs> that's right yeah, yeah yeah all that stuff yeah god i've been down that road a thousand times yeah <laughs> I mean, obviously, the, the thing I think, the, you know, the agency has also been a, a great home for some of the best planners in the world. My very good friend, Jim Carroll, who I think oh. always bring magic to the thinking process. There, there is another very famous 
English creative man of a certain age who spends an awful lot of his time moaning about planning as though it was useless. We both know who that is. I mean, you know, tell us a little <laughs> bit about how you saw planning, you know, in, in the building of the agency. Well, and obviously John was key to that. Yeah. But you had a great culture of planners. We did. And, and it was fundamental to the agency's success because we genuinely believed um, it, it was like, if you get the strategy in the right place, the found, which is the foundation of your thinking, then the creative work can leap even further. You know, as somebody once quite rightly said, the strategy isn't a box, it's a platform from which you can leap as far as you possibly can. And I thought, uh, you know, and I, I, I think I mentioned this already, but when I wrote my book on advertising, I called, I called it turning intelligence into magic. And for me, the planning was the intelligence. And it would come to me with a point of view and it would come to me with some really interesting insights because obviously as a creative person, you have a point of view about lots of things that hopefully what makes you an interesting creative person. But you also, you want that outside influence coming in. And um, planning would come with these fabulous insights. I go, well, that's really interesting. That gives me permission to go over here and do something far more different because I'm obsessed with difference. As a creative person, you're obsessed with difference. You want to make something different. And that's fundamental for communication because that's how we take in information. Even as if you talk to a child psychologist, they will tell you the way babies learn is that you keep having to change the way you talk to them, what you say to them, because they very quickly go, yeah, yeah, you said that, I've got that. Now say something yeah. else. And this is absolutely true. And that they love difference. They love, oh, I haven't seen that before. That's why all their toys are full of color and they move and they do things and they da da da. It's because, oh, I haven't seen that before and I'll keep playing with that. And in the same way that stays with us through the rest of our lives. And the point of a brand is to be different. You know, what, why make an Audi the same as the BMW? Otherwise, well, why just have one car? It could save us all a lot of time. So difference becomes fundamentally important, not only to you as a brand, but also how people respond to your communication. If you keep saying the same thing, I switch off. I've got that. Yeah. I've done that. And, and people are afraid of that. And, and you have to. So that's what in, intelligence gives you. It gives you a different insight. And I, I always... You know, I always use the example of um, Johnny Walker. We started working with Johnny Walker in 1999, 2000, and they came to us and sales were declining, not going very well. Um, whiskey was sort of, you know, a category that was de declining overall, in fact, for everywhere. And um, the, there was a thing about whiskey, and this is the brilliant planner. I think it was Nick Kendall who did it who said, it's very interesting, whiskey always presents itself as success. If you're a success, then you drink whiskey, which is sort of understandable, a bit like champagne. You know, if you want to celebrate, you drink champagne. But he said, you always show success as a place. So it's, you know, some people on a yacht or in a private jet or in some glamorous place. And he said, but success for really, really interesting people is a journey. You never get there. And from that, we instantly got to keep walking. And you think there was a brand, it was called Johnny Walker. It had a striding man in his logo. They never got to that insight until somebody said, success isn't a place, it's a journey. And then rapidly, you get to keep walking. And then you go, I'm now going to do ads about ambition, about the need to keep striving, and that Johnny Walker plays a part in that. So instantly you get to a very, very different looking campaign that stands out in the marketplace. And um, it was hugely successful. But that's a good example of how planning intelligence can take you to a different place and you can then, wow, I want to do that. Yeah, and, and actually, great case study of driving sales and used all over the world. But can, can yeah. we perhaps yeah. unpack another theme here, which is, you know, ironically, I walked past, there's a new Johnny Walker experience store in Madrid. 
um, which is one of those right. things that you look in the window, you can't help but go and look. And I was remembering where that all started. So, you know, I, I hope they remember, you know, how you helped turn that brand. Well, <laughs> tell us a little bit about globalization uh, and, and how you've seen that impact creativity, because you, know, you see it very negatively. Well, I, to a certain extent, I do, um, because I think everybody's tried to do it, regardless of the brand they're working on. The one thing I, I really would like to say to everybody, and this is a very important point, that we all use analogies. You know, we say we did this on that. Therefore, and in the end, all analogies break down. And that what is right for one brand isn't necessarily right for another brand. You have to determine what are the drivers of this brand? What really turns people on about it? The problem that you get with globalization is everybody comes along and it, it was some, somebody in accounts who said, you know, we waste all this money making all these ads all over the world. Why don't we make one ad and run it everywhere? Wouldn't we save a lot of money? And because companies are driven by financial results, everybody jumped on that bandwagon. Now, it may be right for Apple, but it's not necessarily right for maybe a beer, or it's not necessarily right for a marmalade spread <laughs> or whatever. But everybody tries to use it on everything. And that's the problem. What you have to understand is that advertising and a brand is trying to make you a part of culture. How am I a part of culture? How do I raise the importance of what I do so that it becomes more relevant to people's lives? And that is by connecting with people in an intriguing and interesting way. Very hard to do on a global scale, unless there is absolutely global appeal about your product, unless the world agrees on it. So therefore Apple could write, think different and talk about here's to the crazy ones. And that worked, but it doesn't necessarily work when you're advertising a brand, maybe a beer that talks to a local audience. So wonderful example of all that is that, that you know, I, I, I was chairman of a, a, a craft brewery here called Camden Town Brewery and set up in something like 2010. And it spoke very much to the community that it was serving, very much to young, daring, interesting, intriguing, challenging, Camden type people. Um, they launch that brand, that brand takes off. Um, in the meantime, global beer brands are declining. Global beer brand sales are declining because they're doing global advertising. The local audiences, their communities, they're saying, well, it doesn't relate to me. You know, whatever their line might be, it would be about, you know, enjoy the world or some bullshit like that they would have had as opposed to Camden, which made Hell's Lager. It spoke to me. So advertising is trying, you've got to decide, does your brand speak to a Then you have to be successful with that, is that you've got to create work that speaks to them and then grow it from there. You can't instantly go to a global solution. And that's the problem that, that we have. It, it's advertising has stopped talking to individuals. It's stopped talking to communities and it thinks being global is an asset. You know, I think it's wrong. I mean, we have a wonderful example here of Marmite, isn't it? A wonderful campaign where it says you yeah. love it or hate it. It's a particularly UK campaign expressed in a UK kind of way. And, you know, that's incredibly important to Unilever, that brand. Incredibly important. And they, they yeah. you know, when they talk about Unilever, they talk about Unilever, makers of Marmite. Well, Marmite is just bloody yeast spread they make. It isn't the biggest brand they've got, but it's the most famous yeah. brand they've got because it's captured people's imagination. Yeah, and continues to do so, actually, in, in remarkable yeah, ways. Yeah, absolutely. Good... Brilliant. So can, can we perhaps touch on a couple of other areas? Um, love your views on what the obsession with purpose has been doing to advertising. So there's many a brief <laughs> that starts purpose um, and has the faint whiff of greenwashing. Well, what's your view, John? What have you seen? What, what are you watching? Well, what are you thinking? yeah, I, I, I mean, look, first of all, you know, issues like, you know, um, Black Lives Matter, issues like 
um, climate change are fundamentally important. We can't ignore those. But brands thinking that they can latch on to that to sell their product, I think is it is almost insulting. Uh, 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 at best, it's disingenuous. At worst, it's insulting. And you know, I the fact that you support Black Lives Matter is yeah wonderful. But that isn't why I'm buying your product. I'm buying your product because one, it's made ethically. One, it's made in a way which doesn't harm the environment. Two, that you, you're you an equal employer, that you make, you know, I want you to deal with your problems, your issues, and then tell me why your product is so valuable to me. Don't think by just attaching yourself to the latest purpose that you're going to gain support from the community out there. I think that is absolute nonsense. And, and you, you come completely unstuck and, Look what happened to Pepsi Cola when they tried to do that massive own goal instead of telling me why this product is great so that people admire it. And I buy things I admire. That's, you know, but make your product something people admire. Have faith in what you make and make it in a way which people can trust. Fantastic. Well, well sage advice. And, and, and can we kind of talk a little bit about what you're up to now? I mean, I know. Um, you work in the mm. garage and not literally, I, mean, I, I love the name of that. Can you tell us about that? Tell us what you're seeing and particularly yeah. love well, to hear about your series on creativity coming up soon. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Well, at the moment, what I'm doing and I've been doing for the last six years, uh, we set up a company called The Garage in Soho. And The Garage is an early stage investment company that helps um, young ideas get up off the ground. We, we help find them finance. And then we guide them through into growing their company. And our mantra is rather foolishly, in some ways, you might say, don't start a business where well, you have to start a business, but build a brand. And we say that because anybody could start a business. I could do it this afternoon. Building a brand is the most important thing you do because that's where value will reside. And if you're an entrepreneur and you want to sell your company for you know, 100 million as opposed to 5 million, it's the brand somebody will be buying. And we try and remind them that, um, you know, that whatever you've come up with, whatever idea you've got, somebody else will copy you. Somebody else will maybe even develop a bit of better technology. What they won't be able to do is copy the brand. That's where value resides. So that's what I'm doing. Alongside that, the thing that I've been asked to do quite a lot is talk about creativity. And I realized that people just don't really understand it. They are unsure about it. They are wary of it. <clears throat> I'd almost go to far as to say in America, if you use the word creative, people slightly recoil. They say, oh, I see you're going to do that edgy stuff, are you? Um, I don't want edgy stuff. And you try and get them to understand what you mean by creativity. So I thought it would be really good to do a series of we can call them masterclasses on creativity, on how it works, why it's important, how to use it, how to value it, how to take it into your company. And there's a lovely quote from um, McKinsey's that says something like, they've done an analysis of this and they say 63% of, I think it's 63% of companies that engage positively with creativity produce better returns for their shareholders. So I've called this the business of creativity because I want people to understand how to use creativity in their business because ultimately that is what's going to make the difference. All the data in the world won't, but creativity will. So well, that's what I'm, say, I'm looking forward to doing it actually. Yeah, no, and I'm looking forward to seeing it. And we might be cheeky enough to ask you if the WFA can get their members could get some preferential rates when it eventually arrives, but we'll save cheeky we would, for another we would, day. We would, <laughs> no, you can be cheeky today, actually. We would love that. We, I, I would love to do it. I'm not doing this. Look, I'll, I'll say something a bit provocative. I'm not doing this to get rich. I, I've got enough money. I promise you I have. I'm doing this because I passionately believe in the power of creativity and how it is misunderstood and what it can actually do to transform uh, a company and the people within it and please do say to the your, your group we will definitely give them preferential treatment Fantastic. because i want to do i want this to go out there 
Yeah, and it should. And as I said at the beginning, so wonderful to start the new year listening to you on the subject of creativity. It's been in and of itself a masterclass, an absolute delight oh, to spend time you. talking to you. I think you're off to New Zealand tomorrow, aren't you, John? Oh. I am indeed. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm like Mr. Djokovic. I'm vaccinated and everything, and I've got in. <laughs> so hopefully I'll get in. <laughs> you know, my wife, Philippa, is a, a Kiwi, and we go back every year to see family and things like that, which I love. We normally go away five weeks. We get rid of February because February is terrible in the north, uh, northern hemisphere. I always describe, I think I said this to you, February is a bit like Tuesday except there are 28 of them in a row, you know, instead of wishing it away, go away, <laughs> is my, my view of it. Um, but, um, but this year we're going away for six because I've got to, we've got to go into quarantine for 10 days. So um, I'm, I've set myself all sorts of things that I want to do. So hopefully it'll be good. Well, listen, I, don't, I, I thought that was sensational, John. So thank you so much. Oh, really, thank really you, David. Thanks. Awesome. Really Precious great. Well, lovely you. seeing you. Well, what a sensational way to start 2022. And having listened to a legend of creativity, um, how are we going to follow that? We're going to follow it with a legend of the media world. David Porter from Unilever, who knows more about media in APAC and China than anybody else I've ever come across. So really looking forward to that and looking forward to hearing how your 24 Tuesdays have gone uh, when we get to recording the next one. Take care.